Hey, this, this past week, we watched this movie, Steffi and I, we went and saw this uh, film about Winston Churchill. It's referred to as, uh, I think the title's Darkest Hours. And it's about, uh, you know, World War II, but also about uh, one of the most famous evacuations or battles in World War II called Dunkirk. On May 25th, 1940, uh, Winston Churchill, he was the Prime Minister of England, he ordered the evacuation of over 400,000 British and French troops from the French port town of Dunkirk. Uh, the German Blitzkrieg had decimated uh, the Allied armies, the combined armies of the English and French, even Belgium. All that was left for the Germans to do was annihilate the remaining 400,000 forces, and the war would have effectively been over, and perhaps we would be speaking German right now. Most of the men stranded on the beaches of Dunkirk had resigned themselves to death. They had been beaten all the way through France to the shores. They had nowhere else to go, and they were certain they were going to die. And they faced not only their own mortality, but the end of England and the West as they knew it. Churchill and his War Department were hoping beyond hope to at least get 30,000 troops back home, maybe. For nine days, English fishing boats, yachts, and anything else that could stay afloat ferried men back to the shores of England. Over 300,000 men were rescued during that short span of time, so that it is rightly referred to nowadays as the miracle of Dunkirk. You know, our Christian faith is often very similar. We, we are engaged in a spiritual battle. And often I know that you feel as though you're making your last stand against that temptation, that one sin that has pursued you up to the shoreline. You have nowhere else to go, and now it's about to overwhelm you and annihilate you. It's going to own you. It is a hopeless and bleak place where sin dominates your life and you feel as though no one is ever going to come to your rescue you. And this, this isn't even for unbelievers. This is for believers because we still struggle with sin if we're just being honest with ourselves. And so we're tempted every day. We sin every day. And sometimes it is that sin, that one that is just so tempting that you can't resist it given the right circumstances. And it has you there. Now, last Lord's Day, we looked at how to respond when God remains silent to you. We learned that when your prayers are seemingly meaningless and God's word seems irrelevant, uh, we learned that do not, in, under any circumstances, follow the example of King Saul and intentionally sin or refuse to take responsibility for your sin. Those are the worst things you could do. To the contrary, what you should do is run from sin and Repent of them all the time. Now moving forward on to chapter 29, we turn our attention from King Saul to Israel's anointed and future king, David. And here's the question we're going to answer uh, in this text. How does God, at times, keep us from sinning more than we already do? In other words, how does he rescue you out of your sin, that sin? My intent is to enable you to recognize the danger of ongoing sin in your life and the extent of your Father's sovereign power and His boundless love to bring you out of it. So let's get started as we answer this question, how does God rescue you out of your sin? So first of all, what specific sin are we talking about here in the life of David? Uh, it is one we've seen him commit before. It is the sin we often need to be rescued out of as well. It is the sin of seeking and finding refuge with the enemy or enemies of God. Seeking and finding refuge with the enemy. Read there with me verses 1 through 3, chapter 29. Now the Philistines had gathered all their forces at Aphek, and the Israelites were encamped by the spring that is in Jezreel. As the Lord of the Philistines, lords rather, of the Philistines were passing on by hundreds and by thousands, and David and his men were passing on in the, in the rear with Achish, the commanders of the Philistines said, what are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me now for days and years? And since he deserted to me, I have found no fault in him to this day. 
If you recall the reason Saul went looking in last chapter, last Sunday, the reason he went looking for a medium or a witch was due to the fact that he saw the Philistine army and it scared him to death. And, you know, he was no wimp. He was a commander of an army. He had been in battles, but this time, this army had him terrified. And often, and, and again, this proves the point that fear often causes us to compromise our beliefs and to indulge openly in sin because that's what it drove Saul to do. And it did the same thing even to King David or the future king, David. Everybody knew where David was. This wasn't some ill-advised weekend road trip to Vegas, you know, the one you took and you thought nobody knew about. God knows where you were at. He knows. You have that saying, what is it? What goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. Not really. David had lived and served the enemy of God for over a year at this point. So because of fear, he had ran to the enemy. He had deserted God's people effectively. And I get it. He's trying to save himself. You know, I'm, I'm trying, he's, he's rolling with the punches here. That's an easy excuse for all of us. Man, all this bad stuff's going on in my life. Something's got to give. And I'm sure that was his mentality. I've got to live. There's only one place to do that, in the arms of the enemy. Live there for over a year. And so this is the same instance, the same battle lines. Saul is on one side. He sees the Philistines. Philistines. He's completely freaked out. And although he may not have physically seen David with his own eyes, he knew, like everyone else did, out of fear, David had compromised his stated beliefs and was now living with the enemy. Ready now to fight alongside them against his own people, the people of God. So how did David come to this? How did he end up mired down in what can only be described as sin? How did you come to that place out of fear, driven to compromise your beliefs, and now you're ready to actively participate in sin to protect yourself? How did you get to that place? The answer is found in 1 Samuel 27. You can turn there with me real quickly. Verse 1, just one verse. This is how he got to this place. 1 Samuel 27, verse 1. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. This is noth- there is nothing better for me than I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer with the borders of Israel, within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So he's afraid of Saul, and it's interesting, he had an opportunity to kill Saul just prior to this. He didn't do it because he trusted in God at that point, and that's a thing that's true about David, and it's true about you and me. Our faith is never just like, I'm on the mountaintop, I'm always, you know, getting it done. No, our faith is like this. One moment, it's all good, I could have killed Saul, I could have the crown, everything would be great but he trusted that God was in control and he would take care of that without him having to sin and kill the king. And the moment he extricates himself from that situation, now he's thinking like, Saul's gonna keep coming. Even though Saul had pledged, David, I'm not gonna kill you. But he had heard that before. And so he just knew, this guy's gonna keep coming. What am I gonna do? Trust God? No, I'm going to the Philistines. So David knowingly, willingly sought refuge with God's enemy. And here's why. He no longer completely and fully trusted the promise God had made to him. And therefore, he no longer trusted God himself. God had made a very specific, unique kind of promise to him. And we see this in 1 Samuel 16. And again, you can turn there with me. We're going to jump around a bit here. Sorry about the Bible drill thing. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. This goes all the way back to the beginning in regards to uh, just the account of David's life, really. He's a shepherd boy. He's the least among his brothers. 
His dad's name's Jesse, and they, you know, they're just doing their shepherding thing, and this is what happens. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? Saul had been in sin for a long time. Samuel, the prophet, is grieving over the fact that this is the guy that's leading Israel. I anointed this guy. This is who God chose. This is who the people chose. How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. In other words, don't worry about it. Yes, Saul is an unmitigated failure as a king and is a man of God. And so I'm choosing somebody else. So he wasn't just going over there to anoint him and say, yay, you know, God likes you. No, this was, God chose you to be the king, David. And so this was a very specific promise. Then a few verses down, look at verses 11 through 13. Samuel said to Jesse, he had traveled there, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. He had gone through all of them. All of them had failed. None of them had been worthy of anointing. God had not chosen them. Verse 12, and he sent and he brought him in and now he was ruddy and he had beautiful eyes and was handsome and the Lord said, arise, anoint him for this is he, meaning this is the king that I have chosen for Israel. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers and the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward and Samuel rose up and he went to Ramah. He was done. God had chosen, God had made a promise, this is the future king of Israel. And here's the point. God had promised to make David the king, but now David was there, everybody was there, you know, his family and what had, but now obviously David didn't believe that promise. He didn't believe it was possible without compromising his faith and finding refuge with the Philistines. Do you get that? It's interesting. God had made a promise, and in his mind, Because there was a promise made, it validated his sin. Well, I'm supposed to be the king, and so obviously I have to be alive. So I'm scared to death of Saul. He's going to keep coming. I have no other choice but to sin. And it is sin. And so he goes. Okay, so here's a question that maybe David should have asked himself before he crossed over the border to serve and fight for the Philistines. In fact, this is the question you should ask yourself when fear overwhelms you to such an extent that now you're considering compromising your faith in God. And by the way, this is relevant stuff, right? Because you're, you're doing this all the time. You know, I, I don't... I hate having, you know, being honest about our sins from the pulpit. I do, because I know it wounds you. But you need to feel it. And so, you know, you're, you're lonely, you're this, you're that. And so, well, I have this opportunity to not be, and so I'm going to engage in that because, you know, God will still love me, it's all okay. He made a promise, he's going to never leave me nor forsake me, and so... I'm going to sin and ask for forgiveness later. And we, we, we do this kind of stuff all the time. We are so much like David. But here's the question. Is it possible to walk in the footsteps of sinners, to engage in sin? In other words, is it possible to find refuge with them and still expect to be in a healthy and good relationship with God? That's the question David should have asked. That's the question you and I should ask every time fear tempts us to compromise our beliefs. And I know all the excuses. You don't understand. I'm a young man and, you know, I have to view that stuff because, you know, I, otherwise. Or one of these, you, you don't know me. I have to take those drugs. I have to drink alcohol to get through the stress of the day. You don't know what's going on in my life. And yes, I pray, and yes, I go to church, and yes, I read my Bible, but none of that is as effective as that, that numbing feeling. In fact, maybe God is using those things in my life to help me cope with life. 
you don't know. So what happens when we follow in the footsteps of David and run to the enemies of God to find refuge? Here's a few examples. And you don't have to jump to these. I'm just going to quote them. Okay. Psalm 1-1, which, by the way, was written by David. It tells us that in order to be blessed, that is to be the recipient of God's favor, to find authentic and lasting joy in him alone, the blessed man is the one who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And you see the progression of sin as we find refuge with the enemies of God. Initially, we're just simply walking with them and they're talking, yeah? And we're like, okay, yeah, maybe we're doing that. You guys do this on Facebook, man. This is going on in my life. And then like 30 people out of the woodwork, you know, give you all this bad advice. I've read them. It's like, that's not biblical. Good night. What are you talking about? You know, so we're Facebook walking it through that one. The next one, you know, it says is that now you're, you know, you're really hanging out with them. You're standing. And so you stopped doing this and now you're really considering what they have to say. The next progression is you're sitting down. Now you're earnest. I want whatever it is you got. I'm with you. You're a sinner. You're definitely not going to be blessed. What you're going to share with me is not going to be blessed, but God isn't getting it done for me, so let's hear it because I'm going to do that. What David, probably in hindsight of these events, was trying to communicate to us is that it is impossible to have a blessed, a healthy and good relationship with God when you are simultaneously living with and like the sinful world around you. Let that sink in for a moment. Now then, who is it that you're hanging out with? Who are you surrounding yourself with? What kind of influence do they have in your life. Now, I hope that you know me well enough to understand that I'm not saying that you are supposed to hide yourself from the world. We are to go into our communities, our neighborhoods, our places of work, our schools. You and I are to be lights in this world, holding on to the word of life in the midst of this crooked and twisted generation. Uh, the Great Commission found in Matthew 28, 19 admonishes us to go and make disciples of all nations, meaning all types of people, people who live in this sinful, fallen world. Make no mistake, we are sent out into the world to share the gospel, but you are not supposed to find your comfort, your security, your identity with the enemy. So who are you surrounding yourself with? What kind of influence are you allowing them to have in your life? Another verse that warns us about this stuff is 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. In other words, if you find your security, again, it doesn't mean like, okay, I'm never going to talk to another unbeliever. I'm just hanging out with my church people, my family, and that's it. That's not it at all. That is complete and utter nonsense. And there's a lot of churches that have that kind of mentality, and they are either dead or dying, one of the two. But then this, the verse says, hey, if you have bad company, if you hang out with bad, sinful people and they speak into your life consistently and you're taking that, you're finding refuge in that, it's going to rule or rather ruin good morals. So if you find your security and identity within the people and ideologies of the sinful fallen world, your sense of right and wrong, Morality, your sense of right and wrong will eventually become distorted and ultimately destroyed, leading you down a slippery slope of one moral failure after another, and you won't even know it. You'll just be good with it. Like, oh, you want me to go kill Israelites? Let's go do that. Been here a year. What difference does it make? And I understand that there's this insinuation in chapter 29 and even in other verses where David was like, yeah, yeah, I'll go and I'll fight and maybe I'll turn against you in the middle of the fight. I get that. The fact of the matter is that he had found refuge with the enemy and now he was going to face off with his own people. 
So as you follow the sinful world into one sin after another, you will become so callous, so insensitive, you will eventually become a spiritual leper, a living, breathing, yet rotting corpse that feels nothing, incapable of going, that's sin. It's going to ruin your sense of right and wrong. Allow me to press this even further. When you run to the enemy, God has a word for it, and it's not flattering in the least. For example, we find this in James 4.4, the following warning. You adulterous people, there it is. That, that word, we, we don't like using it, adultery. God uses it to describe us. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Of course, we all know what adultery is, right? It's when a husband or a wife violates their marriage vows by finding refuge in the arms of someone else. It's evil because it destroys the most intimate of relationships. That's exactly why God chose that particular word to describe our friendship with the world. We take it as a light thing. Meh. So I sinned. I know it's a sin, but you made a promise. We're good. You'll get over it. God goes, you adulterer. And if you know what that's all about, if you've experienced that in your own marriage, if you've experienced that as a child from your own parents, as a friend, if you've seen that happen, as other friends, their marriages have unraveled, and you've been the collateral damage or the damage itself of that kind of an explosion, of that kind of disaster, then you know how painful, how evil and vile it truly is. And when you and I, when we sin against our Father, and it's not just that, you know, occasional, you know, those are sins too, but it's that one where you find something unique, where it gets you through the day, where it's a part of your life, and you're unwilling, you're not, you know, I'm, I'm just not giving this up because it's, it's who I am, it's what helps me. That's the one that God's going, you adulterer. Have you seen what you've done to us, to me? That's what he's calling it. This is what happens in the heart of God when you find refuge in the arms of the world instead of him. And I know we're throwing some heavy punches here this morning. But please understand, God is in love with you. How is he supposed to react when you're unfaithful to him? Then there's James 1.27, which tells us, religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The implication here is that when you run to the enemy for refuge, you're stained, you are marked by this putrid disgorge of sin. What should sicken you, meaning your sin, now covers you from head to toe for all to see and you're, you're clothed in it and you're just good with it. The last stage, stage rather, can be implied from Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let me bring this all together. When you run to the enemy for refuge, you break the heart of the one who is in love with you, the one who sent his son to die for you. You become a spiritual adulterer, breaking your vows, a spiritual leper, insensitive to your sin, and a mindless drone conformed to the sins of this world. But here's the deal. You do not, and in fact, If you are a son or a daughter of God, you will not, you cannot remain behind enemy lines indefinitely. 
It's like the prodigal found in Luke 15, verse 11 and following. And there I do invite you to join with me and turn there. Luke 15, 11. This is one of the most beautiful, profound portions of Scripture. I find myself gravitating to it often because it's, it's such a redeeming, it's my story, it's your story. This is us. And so we're going to read it it's in its entirety. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. We all know now who we are, what we're really doing when we flirt with sin. We all know what it does to the heart of God, what it should do to us when we find refuge with the enemy. How do we get back home? Here's the picture of it. And he said, meaning Jesus, there was a man who had two sons, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. In other words, hey, when you die, I'm supposed to get an inheritance. Why don't you just go ahead and die and give me that now? Because I have more use for your stuff than I ever would you. That's what his son is telling him. And the father, he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country, far from his father. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Here's the thing about your sin that you run to. It will always leave you. It will always abandon you. And you'll have nothing. There's never enough. It's never satisfying. It is only for a season. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs, the most vile thing that a Jew could do. Not just, you know, eating pigs himself. That would be the most, you know, sinful thing, you know, in their dietary laws. But he's feeding them. And then notice what it says. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. In other words, he was feeding and eating with the pigs. He was living with them. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, that is very important. This is what should happen if, if you are a son or daughter of the Father. You will eventually come to yourself. You will stop making excuses for your sins. You will stop twisting God's word to justify your sins. You will stop being callous and apathetic about your sins. You will come to yourself and you'll go, I'm hanging out with pigs. I thought this was going to be cool. Not so much. And then he says, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. You see, when you come to yourself and you realize the gravity of your situation, the gravity of your own sin, you will not only go to your father, but you're going to go to him with repentance in your heart. And that's what he's saying. Hey, I'm going to go there and I'm going to tell him I sinned. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Isn't that interesting? His dad wasn't, you know, kicking it in, you know, the man cave. Like, yeah, I'm watching the game. I don't know what happened to that kid of mine. Sorry, guy, you know, whatever. Where was he? He was on the edge of his property looking for him like he's going to come back why that's my son and I know he sinned and I let him go he's going to come back so he saw him and he felt compassion his son was still a long way off like so many of us, miles away. He was waiting. He saw him, he felt compassion, not hatred, not revenge, not apathy. He felt compassion, and he didn't wait for his son 
to come and kiss his ring like, oh, it's about time. He ran, embraced, and kissed him. And this is an indignity for the father, a Jewish father of that time. For in order to run, you had to lift your robes. You know, he wasn't there, you know, in his Nike outfit or nothing like that. He had robes on, and so he had to do this and show his legs, which was such an undignified thing for a man to do. But he could care less because love compelled him not just simply to wait, but to do the undignified thing, lift up his robes and run to his son who had sinned against him and had said, I would rather you die than me have to wait around for my inheritance. And he hugged him, he embraced him, and he's covered in filth, the filth of his sin. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead in sin and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. It is time for the prodigals in this room to come home. Come to yourself. Look at what hanging out with the enemy has done for you. Start the long walk home. Your father is waiting there for you. He's always been looking for you. Tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And don't, you know, you just, you just got to go and do that. Don't you want to hear those words once again as he runs to embrace and kiss you? He's going to say, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and let us celebrate. For he was dead and he is now alive. He was lost and he is found. That's you. That can be you. Now then secondly, God keeps us from sinning more than we already do. How? By providentially using evil, now follow me on this, by providentially using evil to deliver us out of sin. Now let's get back to our text. 1 Samuel 29, now in verses 4 and 5. Notice what is said there. The commanders of the Philistines were angry with him, meaning Achish, the king of the Philistines. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Send the man David back, that he may return to the place to which you assigned him. He shall not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. For how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? How could he get back in the good favor of Israel and King Saul? Would it not be with the heads of the men here? In other words, if he killed us, then maybe Saul would be good with him. Never mind, he'd already killed a bunch of Philistines prior to this, and it did him no good. Verse 5, Is not this David of whom they sing to one another in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Now I think it's, pretty obvious that the Philistines as a whole were not only the enemies of God and his people, but they really were the poster boys for evil in their day. And here's the reason I'm I'm stressing this point. God's going to use these men to move David from the front of the lines to the back so he doesn't have to sin any further by killing Israelites. So we know that they're evil, but I just wanted to mention a few things about their character, just again to stress the point. The Philistines certainly weren't choir choir boys, and they weren't your average run-of-the-mill pagan nation either. These guys were the real deal. They were the epitome of evil in their time. As I mentioned in a prior sermon, the Philistines worshipped a so-called god named Dagon, When they captured the Ark of the Covenant during a battle with Israel, they placed the Ark below a statue of Dagon, signifying in their little minds that Yahweh was now subservient to their God. Of course, that didn't work out for them at all. The statue of Dagon kept 
doing face plants overnight off of its pedestal. On one occasion, its hands broke off. On the other one, its head actually got all busted up. And the people themselves developed a bad case of tumors. And so they said, he's got to go. You know, the, the Ark of the Covenant has got to go. And of course, they, they did other things like offer Samson up as a sacrifice and so on and so forth. They, in their worship practices, they would offer children up for sacrifice. These were horrible practices. These were horrible people. They were clearly evil and the enemies of God and his people. And yet David, in his fear-induced lack of faith, sinned by finding refuge in them. Now then, you know we cannot claim ignorance anymore, can we? You cannot do that anymore. You know what sin is. You know if someone is an enemy of God or not by the way that they live, by the things that they tell you. And so you cannot plead ignorance any longer. Well, I didn't know that I was hanging out with somebody that was being a sinful influence in my life. Just like David, you know what you're doing and you know who you're hanging out with. So the Philistines, King Achish, and all of his commanders are evil enemies of God. David knew that. Everybody knew that. And yet here's what we see. Providentially, behind the scenes, if you will, God is still in control. Despite their sinful rebellion, it's no contest. God uses individuals, even entire nations, in all of their sinful nonsense for his will. He has the sovereign power to use them as he wills for his purposes and ultimately for his glory. And here we see our father using these sinful Philistines to rescue David really from himself and from further sin. Look at verse 4 again. He shall not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. So what did King Achish do? Verse 6 six and 7. Achish called David and he said to him, As the Lord lives, you have been honest. And to me it seems right that you should march out and, uh, in, uh, out and in with me in the campaign. For I have found nothing wrong in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, the lords do not approve of you. So go back now and go peaceably that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. So God effectively The sinful commanders said, nope, they're not going. And then also the king, who could have vetoed everything they said, and said, no, he's coming with. I'm the king. That's the way it is. But he relented. As we see the result there in verse 11, David set out with his men early in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. But the Philistines went up to Jezreel. In other words, they went to battle. He went home, back to the land of the Philistines. He was still behind enemy lines, but God had taken him out of the battle and potentially murdering his own people. The point I'm trying to make here is that at times, God will providentially use any means necessary to rescue you out of your sin. Any godly means. Even when you feel unable to remove yourself from that situation. Sometimes even if you're unwilling to remove yourself, he'll create a circumstance using the evil you've surrounded yourself with to just kick you out the back door. And we've seen this before in Scripture. Turn with me real quickly to Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. There it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. I wonder what all things, what could he possibly mean by that? How about everything, anything, including the sinful people and situations you find refuge in at times? God has done it in the past. He will continue to do this in the future. His love for you is so profound that even when you betray him for another, He will eventually exert his unlimited sovereign power to rescue his wayward son or daughter. That means you. That means me. So here's what we've learned. Like David, we too often 
are often guilty of finding refuge with the enemy of God. And like David, God also loves us to such a degree that he will use that evil that we have run to to remove us from its grip. That said, I hope that you now understand and feel the weightiness of your sin and the release that's found only in God's grace. Some of you this morning came here lost in sin. You've run to the enemy. In fact, you are, as Scripture tells us, the enemy of God yourself. But God brought you here sovereignly, providentially, for whatever reason, you're here this morning. Why? To rescue you from your ultimate sin and that ultimate price. And that rescue is found in Christ alone in looking to Him and knowing that He is fully God and fully man, that He has lived the life that you can never live, which is perfect obedience to God's law, and that He died on the cross bearing all of your sins and then three days later rose again, and that by repentance, turning from your sins and trusting in Jesus Christ, you can now be in the robe, not in your own filth, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and that you could be completely and thoroughly forgiven of each and every one of your sins, thought, word, and deed, and that you too, instead of spending an eternity in hell, will have eternal life in the presence of God if you will repent and believe. And some of you need to do that this morning. I like what Winston Churchill said. I don't know when he said this, the context of it. It was probably when things were going very bad for England, which was the lion's share of World War II. But he said this, if you are going through hell, keep going. Don't find refuge there. Do not stop running do not give in. Do not surrender. Keep, go, keep running. Crawl, walk, run. Keep going because your Father is waiting for you there to embrace you and forgive you. And that's what some of you believers, my brothers and sisters, you need to do that this morning because, because you have found refuge in the arms of the enemy. You have broken your Father's heart and he is waiting for you. Keep going As we take a moment here, as our team comes up and we prepare our hearts for communion, that's what I want to emphasize to you. Be broken before him. Come to yourself. Admit that you have found refuge in the arms of the enemy. Confess that to God and rest in this. He's he's not going to just wait for you. He's going to run to you. He's going to embrace you. He is going to celebrate the fact that you have repented and that you are home, and he's going to welcome you back into his arms. Confess, repent of your sins, which is what is necessary for when we come and partake of communion anyway. And so I'm going to have a moment of prayer followed by just a brief moment of silence just to give you opportunity to do that with your Father and then our team will come and we will partake of communion. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do indeed. We thank you. We see in the life of David, we see through his sinful mistakes, and it's far more than a mistake, but we see as evident in what he went through, it is the picture of where many of us are at. Father, we could just wallow in the guilt and shame of it. We could become defensive. Lord, we could look longingly back towards Sodom. Or Lord, we could come to our senses just now. Come with repentance in our hearts and know that you are waiting for us, looking for us even from a long distance off. Help us to abandon the enemy and to run home to you just now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.